ever. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Good morning, everyone. You know, I always, I always say good morning to you to wake you up. Good morning, everyone. It's good, good. Everybody's awake. It's good to be with you all this morning on this blessed day in which we get to gather together to partake of the Lord Jesus Christ and for us to hear his word and to listen to the message that the church gives us. By the way, as you all know, there's two times in the liturgy in which the Lord or the priest will speak and say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord right before the reading of the Holy Gospel and right before the receiving of the Holy Eucharist. So the two times in which the Lord himself ministers to his people, throughout the whole liturgy, of course, but the two times specifically the church is to open up its ears and to be prepared to meet the Lord himself is when the word of God is being uh, read and when we are going to receive the Eucharist as well. Today's gospel is a very powerful gospel because there's so many facets of this re the reading today specifically the gospel reading. But what I want to focus in on is just painting the picture a little bit before we get into the actual heart of the message. And I want to start with, I'm going to go verse by verse with you, but I want us to really imagine this scene. So it was as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret. So there is the massive amounts of people that are excited to hear the word of the Lord. Now you think to yourself, what is it about what Christ was preaching that made the multitudes flock to him? We know now what it is. Like when we read the gospel, it's the good news, right? People were oppressed. People were living under Roman occupation. People were put under bitter bondage and heavy burdens by the people, by the, the leaders of the, of the synagogues. And when Christ came, he came with a refreshing message to every single one of them that he came to give them life in order for them to live it abundantly. So the multitudes flocked to him. And this is why the message of the gospel is so powerful for every single one of us. Because when you read Plato, when you read Socrates, when you read uh, any of other religious texts, all of those things teach you about God. They teach you different philosophical understandings about who God is. But the gospel is God coming to meet us and to reveal himself to us personally. It isn't a philosophy. It isn't something that you intellectualize. It's something that is encountered face to face with God himself. So that's why the multitudes who are really hungry, people who are really hungry to meet Christ, they will flock to him. And that's why whenever you see some, a place in which the gospel is really preached, the multitudes come. The multitudes come. You can fill, you've seen people, preachers, you've seen priests, fill up tens and tens of thousands of people coming to hear the message of the gospel. Why? Because the word of God doesn't need to be marketed. It doesn't need to be like, oh, let me tell you about Jesus. Christ speaks for himself. So the multitudes flock to him because of his sweetness. And he saw two boats. This is a very interesting thing, right? Like when Christ goes into the boats, it's, he had to escape from the multitudes of people. It's like he's being pressed about. So he escapes onto the boats in order for him to be able to speak to the people without them like suffocating him. You know, like you ever, uh, you ever see when one of the bishops or his holiness would come visit and everybody is like surrounding them, wanting to take their blessing, wanting to, uh, you know, spend time with them. Sometimes you have to like put security around them you know, in order to protect the bishops and the clergy because people want to take the blessing of the person. But the fishermen had gone from, there, from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. First off, Simon is probably like, you know, who is this guy? Like, I'd heard about him from my brother Andrew, but why does he want to use my boat? There's the other boat. Why did he choose my boat in particular? But there's a great blessing. Simon doesn't realize who it is that enters into his boat in this moment. He thinks he's just a preacher. He thinks he's just, you know, just an ordinary guy that, you know, one of the many preachers that had come before. But all of a sudden, he finds himself in this boat with the Lord himself. But he's obedient. And he sat and taught the multitudes from the boat. And when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let your nets, let, your, let down your nets for a catch. First off, 
He's been, to- he's been washing his nets. They're, it, it's a, the process to clean a net, first off, is very, very, very complicated. It requires major toil to strip the, the residue and the, the muck that kind of gets built up on the nets. And for Christ, first, let me borrow your boat to preach. I've already been working all night. I'm tired. I want to go home and sleep. Second, let me take your, take, take your nets after I've been cleaning all night and throw them out into the deep. The Lord is asking request after request from Peter. And I think if one actually puts themselves in the narrative, you would find that the next in verse 5, that Peter's response is a very honest one. He said, but Simon answered and said, Master, we've toiled, toiled all night and caught nothing. Like, we've, we've done this. Like, we're expert fishermen. We've toiled literally all night and caught nothing. Like, the, Jesus, keep yourself to the preaching and let us do our job, right? We know what we're doing. This is our responsibility. It's like, imagine me coming to like a carpenter and be like, you know what? I think actually if you do this and this and this, like, intamelek, like, intamin, like, you're, you're a priest. Like, what do you have to do with carpentry? Sibak fahalek, like, you preach and let me do my job. But what Christ there's, there's, there's a very interesting thing. When you look at punctuation in scripture, obviously the, the scriptures were written in Greek, but when you look at the English, there's a semicolon. And a semicolon always indicates a pause, linguistically. Like when you see a semicolon in literature, it always indicates there's a pause. And some people will say that this semicolon is there to indicate that Peter maybe had had a moment where he stopped and paused and was like, am I sure about this? And I think for many of us, Sometimes the Lord asks us to do something that's a little bit challenging in life. Sometimes there's a particular thing that we, we maybe don't want to hear or don't want to do, and there's an indication of a pause for every single one of us. We pause and we're like, is this logical? Does this make sense? Does it sort of calculate? But what Peter does next is the key to this whole gospel reading, is that intellectually, logically, I've processed this information, this request that you've asked me to do, Lord. First, you asked me for the boat. I said, Hadr. Then you've asked me to launch out to the deep. I'm like, ah, oh, Hadr. Like, I think that's the journey of faith, is that sometimes God leads us to places that we don't really necessarily know where the next place is taking us. It's not like I can tell you very clearly when I embarked on this journey to priesthood, I didn't know where my next foot was taking me. But sometimes we will put our place, place all of our trust into the person who's leading us, right? When you know who it is you're lead, who's leading you, you trust that person to lead you on the path that you are going on. The problem with every single one of us is we haven't built that trust. We haven't built that experiential relationship with God where we're like, okay, Lord, if you lead me to the next step, I'm going. I don't make, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't calculate here, but hadr. And Peter does that today. Do you have your hadr moment? Your yes moment. Hadr in Arabic means yes, your obedience moment. Do you have your moment where you say, yes, sir, to the Lord? Lord, it doesn't make sense. Sometimes it doesn't calculate. Sometimes A plus B doesn't equal C. Sometimes five loaves and two fish don't actually have the intellectual capacity to feed 5,000 people. But hadr. I launch out into the deep. And by the way, the question of the launch out into the deep. How many of us, the reason why we can't launch out into the deep is because we have a very superficial relationship with God. Like to launch out into the deep requires, we said trust, it requires obedience, but it also requires a willingness to go deeper, a willingness to actually go to a place which there's a, there's a, there's a famous song that a lot of the youth sing. It's a song called Oceans. And in one of the, the, the lyrics of the words, it says, Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you will call me. That's a very dangerous thing to pray. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. You're standing and you're like, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know where the, the, the I can't see front, left, right, or front, back, left, left, or right. I can't see where I'm going. But you tell me, is that where you want me to go? You want to lead me to the place where, there's, where I don't really have borders to really be able to hold on to? Yeah. That's the journey of faith. That's the journey of trust. And by the way, each and every single one of us, God knows our circumstances. So the person who is very anxious, 
God may want to ch- challenge your anxiety just a little bit. He's not going to ask you to go to the place where you have no borders. He's going to ask you to take that leap of faith first to go out into the boat. Then he's going to tell you, okay, launch out into the deep. Then he's going to tell you, okay, trust me to do this, trust me to do this. The way the Lord works with us is an incremental process. And every single one of us needs to be faithful to him in the small things in order for him to, for us to trust him in the bigger things as they come. The problem with us, me first and foremost, is we haven't, we haven't trusted him in the little things in order to trust him for the big things. So master, we've toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners the other boat to help come and help them, and they came and filled both the boats, and they began to sink. Here's the beautiful thing. In the obedience of Peter, what happens? He launches out into the deep, and then all of a sudden he's like, this actually doesn't make sense. The day, fish don't come out in the water in the daytime. They're usually out at night. Like, why are we fishing during the daytime? This is a bad idea. But what he does, he throws out... The net starts to break. He calls for backup, the abundance of blessing that comes into Peter's boat from the Lord asking him to do something and him being obedient starts to overflow. And look at what Peter responds and says. He says, but Simon Peter saw it and he fell down at Jesus' knees and said, depart from me for I am a sinful man, O Lord. The response indicates what was going on in Peter's heart. The response indicates that he was maybe a little bit not sure. Maybe he was a little bit struggling. So the response is he had, he kneels down before the Lord and he says to him, depart from me for I am a sinful man. And the Lord basically says to him one of the most powerful things, for he he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish, fish. Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. You're worried about all this stuff. You think it's about the catch of fish. You think that I'm trying to lead you to trust me to just fill up your boat. Like, is it about filling up your boat? I can fill up your boat without me having you to throw the net in. All of a sudden, you could look down and the boat can be filled. But what I'm teaching you is every step, every ask that I have of you teaches you to trust me. And the more you trust me, the more that I will use you abundantly in order to be able to do beyond just fishing. That's the goal. The goal is not for the Lord to satisfy our financial needs or our, you know, our materialistic needs. The goal of the Lord is to teach us how to become fishers of men. To actually through our trust, through our obedience, through our discipleship, through our willingness to follow him day in and day out. There is something that happens to me in the process of doing so that allows me to trust him and allows me to be able to tell people about his faithfulness. I want each of you to think for a second right now. Think about a moment in your life, maybe in the last year, maybe in the last three years, maybe in the last five years, where you thought this situation is impossible. Lord, I can't get out of this. It's a hopeless situation. There's no way that you are going to open up this Red Sea that I'm standing before. And then all of a sudden you find yourself, the sea is split. You're like, what? How did this happen? And God is saying to you today, You trusted me in the past, and I was faithful. You trusted me in the past, and I was faithful. I was able to split that sea for you. Trust me today. Trust me in the little things today. As you trust me in the little things today, you watch how when you trust me in the past, you trusted me in the past, I was good. You trust me in the present, I will be good. It may not look the way you want it to look. It may not operate the way you want it to operate. But you trust me, and you watch, and you see what I am doing in you is just as important as what you want me to do for you. What I'm doing in you, in the process of you being obedient and trusting me, step by step, is just as important as what you want me to do for you. The process is just as important as the destination. And the process that the Lord was leading Peter to was the process of him becoming St. Peter, the rock in whom the church will be built on. The question for every single one of us is this. Do I trust him in the little? Am I obedient in the little? Am I obedient with just my, my hidden things? Am I obedient with my Bible reading? Am I obedient with my prayer life? Am I obedient when everyone around me is gossiping? Everyone around me is, is, is sharing the tea with one another. 
You know, the tea is another expression for gossip. Am I, am I one of those people that contributes or am I one of those people that says, you know what? Nope, not interested. It's not my place. I'm not gonna do that because I want to be obedient. Am I the type of person in which behind closed doors, I'm the same person as I am in front of people? Do I live a double life? This is actually the biggest problem within the church is many of us have the outward appearance of godliness, but by our works, we deny him. By the way we live our lives, we live very counter what in secret what we are publicly in front of people. And that's why some people will say, Abuna, I, I listen to people's confessions, Abuna, my parents or my siblings or me sometimes, I appear so, so, and so in front of everybody, but behind closed doors, I'm the furthest person. We can't let this double-mindedness be in our church. The Bible says a man who's double-minded is unstable in all his ways, unstable in everything. So what we need to do is we need to learn to be obedient in the little things, in the little things, saying, Lord, today I'm not going to let one word come out of my mouth that is critical or disrespectful to another person. Lord, today I'm going to read my Bible reading and I'm going to take one verse from the Bible and I'm going to try to apply it today and live it. Lord, I'm going to be committed to my prayer life. Lord, I'm going to be committed to sharing the good news and to be an ambassador of peace to every single person that I encounter. Because when the Lord rose from the dead and he appeared to them on the Sea of Galilee, the first time Peter threw out and launched into the deep, the net was breaking. He wasn't ready to keep those fish yet. He wasn't ready to truly be a fisher of men. But the second time he launched out to the deep on the Sea of, of Galilee, what happened? The net didn't break. The net didn't break because now Peter was ready to be truly a fisherman and the Lord was now tasking him with the responsibility in order for him to go out and to be the evangelist that was going to advance the gospel in the way that he did. Every single one of us are called not for our nets to be broken, not for, our, for us to be in a spirit of doubt, a spirit of fear, a spirit of, of, of dishonesty. But our goal is, as beloved children of God is to go out and to have our fish nets be available and ready for us to catch men and to share the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ with every single person that we encounter. I'll finish off with a story. Somebody sent me this story a few months ago, and last night, right before I was going to sleep, I read it, and it was very powerful for me. So bear with me for a second, because I think it'll tie in this message this morning in a very powerful way. It talks about how on a dangerous seacoast where shipwrecks often occur, there was once a crude little life-saving station. The building was a hut, and there was only one boat. But a few devoted members kept constant watch over the sea with no thought for themselves. When one day, when, when they went out one day and they, at night they, tired, they were tirelessly searching for the lost. Some of those who were saved, there was a shipwreck one day and they were tirelessly searching out for those who were lost. Some of those who were saved and various others in the surrounding areas wanted to become associated with the station and gave of their time and money and effort to support its work. New boats were bought, new crews were trained, the, life, the little life-saving station grew. Bear with me. Some of the members of the life-saving station were unhappy that the building was so crude and poorly equipped. They felt that a more comfortable place should be provided at the first refuge of those saved from the sea. They replaced the emergency cots with beds, put better furniture in the enlarged building. Now the life-saving station became a popular gathering place for its members. And they decorated it beautifully because they use it as a sort of club. Fewer members were now interested in going to the sea on life-saving missions. So they hired lifeboats, lifeboat crews to do this work. The life-saving motif still prevailed in the club's decorations. And there was a liturgical lifeboat in the room where the club's initiations were held. About this time, a large ship wrecked off the coast and the hired crews brought in boats of cold, loads of cold, wet, and half-drowned people. They were dirty and sick. The beautiful new club was in chaos. So the property committee immediately had a shower house built outside of the club where victims of shipwrecks could be cleaned up before, the, before coming inside. 
At the next meeting, there was a split among the club membership. Most of the members wanted to stop the club's life-saving activities as being unpleasant and a hindrance to the normal social life of the club. Some members insisted upon life-saving as their primary purpose and pointed out that they were still called a life-saving station. But they were finally voted down and told that if they wanted to save the lives of all the various kinds of people who were shipwrecked in those waters, they could begin their own life-saving station. So they did. As the years went on, the new station experienced the same changes that had occurred in the old. It evolved into a club, and yet another life-saving station was founded. History continued to repeat itself. And if you visit that seacoast today, you will find a number of exclusive clubs along that shore. Shipwrecks are frequent in those waters, but most of those people drown. Ladies and gentlemen, do we want to catch men, or do we want this to be a club? Do we want this to be a house that is filled with people who are drowning, or do we want this to be a club? If this is a club decorated with nice fancy stuff where people that just come and attend to be social, we're missing the mark. We're missing the mark deeply. But if the Lord is asking us today to launch out into the deep, to be obedient in the little things in order for us to be fishers of men, our disobedience is rebellion. Our disobedience is rebellion. And until all of us, me first and foremost, we go back to the original intent of what we are called to do as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is to be ambassadors of life, to go save those who are drowning. We will forever be in a place in which we are trying to just gather people to a place, but they will drown in this place with us. And the last thing that we want the church to be is to be a social club. So may God encourage us through this message today to launch out into the deep, to be obedient, to be faithful, to trust in his word, in order for us to be those who are going out into the deep, rescuing our brothers and sisters and rescuing our own families, first and foremost, in order for us to be a light to the world, a city on a hill, that every single person sees us and glorifies our Father in heaven. Glory be to God forever. Amen. Amen.